This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome. I'm sorry that we're a little late getting started this morning. We had some brief technical difficulties. Thank you for those of you who uh, prayed us through that. We're up and running. It's good to be with you on this Palm Sunday morning. Now, I know that some of you were so excited about the service today that you actually tuned in yesterday, thought it was Sunday. Well, that's all right. Now we're together. We're apart, but we're together. You know, there's an ad running on the television these days that says, apart, together. But you know, I think it would be more appropriate for us to say that we are together, apart. Even though we're divided into different spaces this morning, we're together, united in Christ. It's good to be together. It's good to be together on this Palm Sunday, a day when we recognize who Jesus is, and we join with those who celebrated the reality of Jesus the Messiah. So on Palm Sunday morning, we want to begin by reading a psalm. The psalm that we read is 118. I'm going to pick it up with the 19th verse, and it goes like this. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. We pray. Father God, we thank you today for this Palm Sunday morning, an opportunity to focus on who you are. We join with those who went with you in procession into Jerusalem so long ago, and we say, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus, we ask that you would be with us today where we are. Thank you that you come into our homes and into our hearts. And we ask God that this morning would be a time of true worship as we sense your presence and experience a real relationship with you. Amen. Well, we are living through hard times. This is something we've never experienced before, not in our lifetime, a pandemic of this nature. And it has other consequences, too, economic hardships for many people. And yet, as we go through these things, we know that we are not alone, that God is with us. He is with us all the way. You know, this morning, I've been thinking about the, the reality of, of Palm Sunday and, and what it means. And I've reflected on the fact that Jesus talked a lot about possibilities. Even though he confronted a great deal of hardship during his life, and even though he had his life taken from him cruelly, he was a man, a man of God, and the God-man who saw the possibilities in everything. As I study the life and the teachings of Jesus, I discover that he continually talked about possibilities. God inspired possibilities. No founder of any man-made religion ever used the word possible as much as Jesus. Listen to these words of Jesus. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. Everything is possible for one who believes. Mark 9, 23. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. 
all things are possible with God. Abba, Father, everything is possible for you, Mark 14, 36. What is impossible with man is possible with God, according to Luke 18 and 27. Now, I want you to keep in mind this possibility theme as we work through the 26th chapter of Matthew, because we're going to come back to it as we go along. Today, as we've said, is Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, Jesus made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He was followed by huge crowds that sang his praises. It was an exciting day. The disciples must have been tremendously excited about what was about to happen. Was this the time that Jesus was going to actually take the reins of kingship? Was he going to take control? Was this the beginning of the end? Well, it was the beginning of the end in a way they did not expect. On the night of April 3, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King gave his final speech. It was called, I've Been to the Mountaintop. It almost seemed in that speech as if he understood that the end of his life might be near. This is what he said. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop, and I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. The following day, Dr. King was assassinated. Well, he may have had a sense that for him, the end was near. But Jesus was much more definite than that. In the 26th chapter of Matthew, Jesus has just concluded a long discourse. I guess you could call it a speech. And according to Matthew 26, beginning with verse 1, we read, When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen to him. Here he made his prediction. And right after that, Matthew tells us about the plot. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or there may be a riot among the people. Of course, these Jewish rulers were concerned that they not lose control of public order. They were under the thumb of Rome, and Rome, above all, demanded order. And they were fearful of anything that would cause a riot. Well, as we read through this chapter, and I'll comment some as we go, I want you to be aware that this immediately follows Palm Sunday. What is described in Matthew 26 is the beginning of the end of the tragedy. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Well, of course, what Jesus said there is coming true today, isn't it? As we share the gospel story, once again, we're hearing about this woman's extravagant love. You know, 
These days when a young man intends to propose to his beloved, it's more or less expected that he's going to buy an engagement ring. And that engagement ring, we are told, is supposed to represent two months' salary. That's extravagant love. But nothing compared to what this woman did for Jesus. We read in another place that the perfume could have been sold for 300 denarii. Now, a denarii was the equivalent of a day's wage for a working man. 300 denarii would be almost a year's salary. And yet this was the perfume that she poured out on Jesus. Talk about sacrificial love. When the disciples saw it, we're told they were indignant. They said, we could have sold that perfume and the money could have been given to the poor. Why this waste? But love is not a waste, is it? That which is given in love is never wasted. Judas, we know, was particularly incensed at what had been done. Judas was the treasurer for the group. When Jesus traveled with his disciples, it was Judas who carried the bag with the money, who paid the expenses as they went along. And we know that Judas was a greedy man. In fact, he was a thief. The Bible tells us that he would help himself for his own personal use to the money that had been given for the ministry that Jesus was carrying out. So he was, he was no doubt very upset at what had happened. He would have been able to uh, abscond with some of that money for himself. In fact, it's immediately after this expression of love by this woman that Judas goes to the rulers of the people and makes his dastardly agreement. Then one of the twelve, we read, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. We wonder what could have possibly motivated a man like that. Was it simple greed? If so, what a terrible, terrible thing. You know, the Bible tells us to be on guard against all kinds of greed. A lust for money, the Bible tells us, is at the root of all kinds of evil. And maybe it was disillusionment and hatred that motivated Judas. After all, he had expected Jesus to set himself up as king. That wasn't happening according to his plan. Maybe what he now felt was hatred, or perhaps he was just trying to force Jesus' hand. He would have to take action when the people came after him. We don't know all that was going on inside of the man's twisted and evil mind, but we do know that this was something that God used to work out his plan and his purpose. We read now about the last supper that Jesus had with his followers. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? He replied, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. I'll just pause there for a moment. Judas had been part of the group. He had successfully hidden the sin in his heart from his fellow disciples. But he could not hide it from Jesus. Jesus knew exactly who was going to betray him. He knew precisely the evil within the heart of Judas. All of the disciples, it says, were very sad. And they began to say to Jesus, one after the other, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. There was an element of self-doubt within each of them. Jesus replied, 
the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. You know, we realize that later on, after the arrest of Jesus, when he was condemned to death, Judas was filled with remorse. He wanted to undo what he had done. He ran back to the temple. He attempted to return the money to the Jewish leaders. They wouldn't accept it. In desperation, he flung the money on the floor of the temple, ran out, and committed suicide. There's a sobering lesson here. Sin, once committed, cannot be undone. But praise God, it can be forgiven. We continue our reading. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Fascinating. Jesus took the ancient Passover ceremony, a ceremony that remembered the release from slavery in Egypt, and gave it an additional new and deeper meaning. He said, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. This is my body. This is my blood. And in a spiritual sense, this is so. Next Sunday is Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And we look forward to celebrating Easter by observing Holy Communion together. At the end of the meal, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The hymns that were sung at the Passover meal were actually psalms. And they included the psalm that we read together at the beginning today, Psalm 118, which contains the verse that we use to start our worship services. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will be glad and rejoice in it. Let's pick up the account. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Once again, Jesus knew exactly where people were at, what was going on within the hearts of those people who loved him. They wanted to be courageous, but they were relying on themselves to stay strong. You know, our own strength will let us down. It's only in the strength of Jesus, the strength of God, that we can deal with the situations that life brings our way. We may fail God, and we do at times but he will not fail us. Now we come to Gethsemane, the garden on the Mount of Olives where Jesus often went to pray, many times in the company of his disciples. We read, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter, and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. 
Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. And I want you to listen carefully to the words of the prayer that Jesus prayed. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Do you remember all those times that Jesus spoke about everything being possible? With men it is impossible, he said, but with God all things are possible. Now, in his hour of deepest need, he prays and he says, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. I thought about that a lot. We know that God is all-powerful. Can God do literally anything? Did you know that there are some things that God cannot do? The Bible tells us in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot do anything that is evil. God cannot and will not do anything that is contrary to his nature and his character. He is a good God, and he is a holy God. He allows things to happen that are not good, things that are painful. We need to remember that he's a big picture God. From where we are, things seem to be falling apart. But from his perspective, things are falling into Jesus prayed, if it be possible. There are things that people have asked down through the years about God's all power. I remember somebody presenting me with this question one time. He said, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? Now, that's a bit silly, isn't it? God doesn't work uh, against himself. He doesn't work opposites. He doesn't make things go up and down at the same time. But here we find that God makes choices. Jesus said, if it is possible, Father, may this cup be taken from me. And by cup, he meant the suffering and the death that he was soon to die. But then he said, yet not as I will, but as you will. You know, you and I do things that are wrong. Sometimes when we do something stupid or hurtful, we say afterwards, oh, that's just not me. I'm not like that. But sadly, there are times when we are like that. It's in those times of challenge that character is revealed. But when we look to God, he never does anything wrong. And he always makes choices from his perspective, things that will work out for the best in the end. You see, when Jesus prayed, he prayed that the cup would pass from him, but then he prayed this most incredible and important prayer. He prayed, not as I will, but as you will. After he had prayed that, it says that Jesus returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. He said to them, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. And then he said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. That's what we need to do. Watch and pray. The spirit is willing, Jesus said, but the flesh is weak. We may have the best of intentions, but we fall short if we rely on our own strength. Jesus went away a second time and prayed, My Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Isn't that interesting? 
This is the first time that Jesus ever suggested that something was not possible. God could have saved his son. Jesus himself said that he could call on legions of angels to come and rescue him. But the sad and wonderful truth is this. Jesus could have been saved, but had he been saved from death, we could not be saved. God the Father made a choice. He gave his son to die for us. Jesus went along with that choice. Father, not my will, but yours be done. What incredible love. Love without limits. God was willing to stop at nothing to help us. And then, when Jesus came back to his disciples again, he found them once more sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. What was the same thing? My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus was not only willing, he was determined to go to the cross. He knew that this was the way, the only way that ordinary men and women, people like you and I, could be made right with God. He took the penalty for us. He paid a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not Incredible love, matchless love, limitless love. That's the way God loves you. And the only appropriate response is to receive his love and his forgiveness and to follow him in faith and obedience. Let's love him in return. Jesus told us that that is the greatest commandment of all, to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Let's do it. Let's do it. Amen. And now, receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace.